What's going on, perfumery people? So in today's video, I wanted to kind of revisit an old video I did like two years ago where I talked about, you know, some of the things that you're going to need uh, to purchase if you are thinking about getting into DIY or, you know, do-it-yourself perfumery at home. You know, what are some of the equipment that you're going to need? Now, in this video, I'm not going to talk about all the individual materials that I'm going to recommend. I'm going to focus just on the necessary equipment um, that you're going to need. Because I know like two years ago when I did this video, I touched very briefly on the basics like scales and alcohol and things like that. But I want to kind of elaborate just a little bit more. Um, so yeah, so let's just dive in. <clears throat> and again, this is more for first time viewers or somebody that's just considering getting into, hey, I wanna make a perfume at home. What is some of the equipment that I'm going to need initially uh, when I first start? I wanna get all the right things, the right components, the right equipment and things like that. So I'm gonna focus on that. So obviously the first thing I'm gonna talk about is a scale. <clears throat> so for somebody that's watching this video for the first time is probably thinking, well, in perfumery, can I just you know, you know, measure things by drops or measure it by, you know, the the actual volume like milliliters? Because they think in terms of milliliters. Because when you purchase a perfume from like say a department store, you buy a hundred ml bottle, fifty ml bottle. So people have this notion in their head that, oh, I'm going to weigh and measure things in volume, which is milliliters. No, that is not the case you will be doing perfumery based on weight because individual materials uh, all weigh a little bit differently. So for example, like one drop of this material might weigh out on a scale like 0 0.015 grams, but then like one drop of a very thick, uh, heavy material might weigh out to 0 0.025 grams. And so one drop uh, is never equal when you're dealing with different kinds of materials. So everything is always recorded uh, and measured in weight in perfumery. So let's talk about what kind of scale you're going to need. Now there's three main factors that I look for in a good scale for perfumery. The first factory is what is the max weight capacity? So scales can come in very different shapes, sizes, and, and you know different uh, various degrees of like if it's a cheap scale, if it's a professional scale. So the max weight capacity is just basically how much can this scale hold. And when you're doing do-it-yourself or DIY, you know, perfumery at home, you're not doing large mass scales of jugs and pails. If you are. This is probably not the video for you. We're going to talk small scale. We're making maybe one to, you know, 10 bottles at a time max. So a good scale for a max weight capacity that I recommend would be 200 grams max weight capacity. You can probably get by with maybe 100 grams, uh, you know, max weight. But I think, you know, the difference in price between a 100 gram to a 200 gram max weight capacity could only be like $20 difference in the price of the scale. So just go ahead and get the 200 gram max weight capacity. Um, <clears throat> that's the one I have and it, it's served me well throughout the years. The second thing you're going to want to look for in a good scale is what they call readability. And the readability is basically the digits that display on the scale. And you want something with a very broad readability, uh, meaning how many decimal or how many digits after the decimal point will register on the scale. So I always, always, always look for something that reads three, des uh, three digits after the decimal point. So it'd be like 0 0.000. And the reason for that being was the classic example of, you know, one drop of this material might weigh only 0 0.015 grams, but one drop of this super thick viscosis material might be 0 0.025 grams. So that extra third last digit helps keep a very tight variance, uh, very tight accuracy uh, when you're measuring um, on a drop by drop basis. So if you ever come across a scale that only reads at 0, 0.00, which is two digits, you're probably going to have a hard time 
uh, recreating a formula with good accuracy. Uh, so I always recommend uh, readability of three digits after the decimal point, so 0 .000 readability. Now the third factor that probably gets overlooked the most is the accuracy. <clears throat> Not every scale has good accuracy. And what that means is like a cheap scale can sway in variance. So if you're actually taking one drop of something, it weighs 0 0.015. But if you take the same material and take another drop, and if it now weighs 0 0.02, that's a five, uh, point, you know, that's a, a five, uh, sorry, fumbling over my words. That's a 0 0.005 gram difference between those two drops. And that can make, a, make or break a formula depending on how potent the material is. So a lot of the manufacturers of scales have specs usually listed on their website or in the PDF manual of what their accuracy rating is. And the accuracy rating, usually what I look for is a plus minus variance of 0 0.003 grams, meaning any single drop of the same material may vary either up or down by 0 0.003 grams. When you get to something with an accuracy of like say 0 0.005 grams up or down, uh, then now you're looking kind of, it's not very accurate, it's a little wishy-washy and shaky. I always stick to an accuracy reading of 0 0.003 grams. So good scale. Uh, to recap, max weight capacity, 200 grams. Readability, three, di uh, three digits after the decimal point, and with an accuracy rating of anything plus minus 0 0.003 grams of variance up or down is what I look for. And like this scale here cost me, I think, like $129. Don't worry about brand names. Uh, brand names doesn't mean squat because like a scale of thi like this particular scale, I've seen it rebranded with so many different brand names, but it's the same guts and components and the same body. It's just, you know, all made overseas in some factory and they're, you know, sourcing it out to different retailers and they just slap a label on it. It's all the same stuff. So just look for those three main factors and expect to pay around $100 to $150 for a scale of that quality that I'm, you know, kind of explaining and recommending. So that's enough about the scale. Now, let's see, the next thing you're definitely 100% going to need is glass beakers. Now, glass beakers, um, usually you can easily find these on Amazon, like a five or a six pack of 50 ml glass beakers will run you like 10 bucks. They're super cheap. I always suggest getting at least five or six to start off with of the 50 ml beakers. And also have a couple hundred ml beakers handy too, just in case if you wanna do some larger batches. And they also make some that are like 250 ml size beakers. And you might wanna grab one of those too for good measure. But you definitely, definitely will need some beakers. I would say if you ever come across these tall glass cylinders, you're probably not going to use it. I mean, something like this is specifically measuring milliliters, which is volume, but we're not using volume or milliliters. We're using grams uh, in weight. So you don't need all this unnecessary tall cylinder glass beaker. I always go for the short stubby, you know, fat one so you can easily get your pipette in there and drop everything in there without making a mess. <clears throat> So we got scale, we've got beakers. Now let's talk about pipettes. Now there's two kinds of pipettes that you can get out there. Um, one is the plastic disposable ones and the other is the actual glass one with the rubber bulbs. Now there is no right or wrong way in getting a pipette. You use what you are comfortable in using. I know I started with disposable plastic ones for a little bit and then I found it got pretty annoying for me because I felt very wasteful because once you use a plastic disposable pipette once you use it you pretty much toss it so while yes you can get them for pretty you know cheap I always found myself needing to order disposable pipettes like on a weekly basis because when I'm formulating and on average, like a typical, you know, full finish fragrance for me contains about 30 to 50 
individual materials. That means every time I do a one batch blend, it's gonna take 30 to 50 disposable pipettes. So if you take the cost factor into it, usually when you're buying disposable pipettes, you can get a bag for 100 you know, pipettes, you can get a bag of 500 pipettes, but that's only gonna last somebody like myself only a couple weeks before I have to reorder again. So I found that I prefer to use glass pipettes with the rubber bulbs because I can wash them and reuse them over and over and over. And the nice thing is too, like for an example of this formulation that I'm working on, I have all my materials laid out and each pipette is specifically laid out in front of each material. So I know this particular material, I'm always gonna use this glass pipette. And I'll work on this formula for like an entire week, uh, every day making a new trial batch, new experiments, and I could always reuse the same glass pipette. And then when I'm done throughout the week, I just take them all up, pull off the rubber bulbs, and wash all the glass pipettes and reuse them for whatever. They're, they're, they're good as new once you wash them. So it's up to you as far as what you're gonna want to use for uh, pipettes. I prefer glass. Uh, some people like the plastic disposable ones. Just keep in mind, if you do plastic disposable, you are going to continuously repurchasing more and more and more. The more involved you get into perfumery, the more trial batches and formulations you try to do, you're just you're burning through a lot of cash while they are relatively inexpensive. It's just a nuisance for me to constantly, every week, have to order more and more and more. So I prefer glass pipettes. You choose what you want to use. I would urge anybody that's going to start off with purchasing glass pipettes, start off with getting 50 of them. Because like I said, a typical full finished fragrance can range in between like 30 to 50 individual materials and ingredients in one perfume. So if you're gonna do a, a full run of a perfume, you're gonna need at least 30 to 50 pipettes at your disposal. So get at least 50, I would say. <clears throat> uh, let's see, the next thing we can talk about, scent strips. Now, scent strips are pretty vital, in my opinion. Uh, if you're ever doing you know, evaluations of materials, you can always dip it in the bottle, smell it off the scent strip. If you want to do you know, let's say I want to see what this material, this material, and that material smells like. I would dip one each in their own pipette, and I can just hold all three in front of my face, wave them around, kind of mess with the pseudo, con you know, pseudo uh, concentration and kind of lower it. If I feel this one's a little too strong, I can bend it back, smell it, and be like, no, let's bring it back up. I want it a little stronger. There we go. So, anyways. Scent strips are pretty vital. Uh, you can find them relatively cheap, again, on Amazon, but be wary of the quality. So there are some sellers on Amazon that sell scent strips that are very flimsy and cheap. Like, look how, like, look at this. I'm just, this is supposed to be a scent strip and you could almost hold it up to the light and see through it. It doesn't hold oil very well. So this, I don't recommend these flimsy, floppity uh, scent strips. I would recommend something that has a, a definite thicker cardstock, something that doesn't bend as easily. Uh, it holds the oil better and it just feels sturdy in the hand. Uh, so when you're holding it, it's not flopping all over the place. So definitely, definitely will need a lot of these. Um, usually you can find them in packs of like 100 or 200 cent strips for like $5 or something like that. So usually I always grab like 200 and that'll last me a couple weeks, maybe a month, and then I'll order 200 more. And just, it's a constant purchase cent strips. You're always going to be buying that. Now, um, let's see another thing that you're probably going to want. And this is something that you eventually will purchase. Uh, glass funnels. And the reason for glass funnels is uh, eventually when you do finish a perfume, you have a formula that you've created, it's perfect, and you're like, I want to make a, a large batch of concentrate so I can make uh, you know many bottles of fragrance with this. With perfumery, once you make a concentrate batch, let's say... I'm going to fill up one of these you know small 100 ml bottles. Uh, with concentrate, 
Eventually, you're going to store this concentrate for a few weeks up to a month to macerate. Um, and then once you're done with that, you're going to want to filter because what does happen is, especially if you're using natural materials like raw, like say, you know, rose auto, uh, natural uh, patchouli and things like that, because naturals do contain particles and sediments, that's something you don't want in your perfume. So you're going to want a glass funnel with filter papers so you could actually pour your finished concentrate with the filter paper in there and it'll slowly drain it out and you'll have a beaker under here and it'll track and you know keep all the the particles and all the unwanted things in the filter paper and leaving you with just pure uh, of your concentrate fragrance and that's something you're going to want to do when you get to the end phase of making an actual fragrance so with the glass filter, I would also urge you, I don't know if you can see it, maybe it's off camera, you're going to want some sort of device that actually appends and holds this upright. Usually it's like a tall device. Maybe you can see it off, it's probably off camera, but I've got one here that you can rest this on and then you can take one of your beakers, place it here and it pours it in and you can literally just walk away and it'll pour out within five to 10 minutes and filter your fragrance. So definitely want one of those devices. And since we're on the topic of filtering, filter paper is very important. I know a lot of people are probably cheap and probably just like, oh, I can just use a coffee filter or something. No, you, you really don't want to. Like if you're gonna do it the right way, you want to use commercial grade filter paper that is specific for the application. In this case, the only one that I ever purchase is from a company called Wattman, and they have different grades of how porous and how thick or how much materials and particles it will trap in here. Uh, the brand is called Wattman, and the filter grade that I purchase for fragrances is filter grade number one. They have a number one, a number two, a number three, and down the, and down the line. All these different numbers just represent, you know, specific applications. But for perfumery, just stick to Wattman brand filter grade number one, and you're good to go. Like this right here, I've got a pack of 100. You probably get it for 10 bucks on Amazon. Now, the funny thing is, is they give it to you in a round disc, and you're like, well, how does that work in something like this? Easy. What I usually do is just kind of fold it like so. Actually, this is a bad representation, but if you fold it just right and then crease it so it's shaped like a cone, you can literally just drop it right in. And sometimes it stays. Sometimes you might, might want to get like a piece of tape just to hold it down. And it just sits like that. And then you would just pour your concentrate in let it filter out, and you're golden. So that's paper, filter paper. Uh, another thing that you are definitely going to want to get is empty Boston Round glass bottles. And the reason for that is when you're purchasing raw materials, uh, sometimes you might buy them in quantities of a large bottle and you don't wanna keep lugging large bottles onto the table, especially if you're doing a formulation where you've got like 30 materials, you won't be able to fit 30 gigantic bottles all lined up here. And I like to keep these little uh, Boston Round bottles to use as my working materials and I would just fill these up with my materials. Now the thing is, there's two kinds of bottles um, that you're gonna wanna get. Now, not necessarily kinds, let's talk about color. So you can get Boston Rounds in clear like this, or you can get tinted glass, which usually is like amber brown. Sometimes you might see them in blue, sometimes you might see them in green or red. Most common is amber brown. I would probably always get amber brown colored Boston Round bottles. And the reason for that being is, 
When it's tinted, it's um, the material inside is now safe against UV light, sunlight, and things like that. Because a lot of people don't realize a lot of materials, especially naturals, especially citrus essential oils, are very sensitive to sunlight. So if you store it in a glass bottle like this, and you have your bottle just sitting out in a room where there's uh, open, you know, just windows and sunlight coming in, your material in this bottle is going to degrade much faster than normal. So in that case, you would put those oils in the brown tinted uh, Boston Round bottles, which honestly, the price difference, if you go to a, a company where they offer both clear and brown tinted at the same price, just always get the brown ones. Don't mess with it. The only reason why I got some clear ones here is because the manufacturer that I purchased from actually supplies it cheaper uh, when you buy it in bulk or... Here's an example of a brown tinted Boston Round. So now with bottles, another thing that we're gonna talk about is caps. Caps are very, very important. And the reason for that being is, I've seen a lot of people, they make the mistake thinking, I'm gonna buy a bottle that already has a cap, that has a pipette like already kind of infused in it. It's like a, a combo cap pipette all built into one. Don't buy those. Just, you're, you're gonna ruin your materials. And the reason for that is, when you have a cap that already has a pipette like infused in the cap or built into the cap, the seal where the pipette, the rubber bulb, and the top of the cap is not an airtight seal. So you are going to get air leakage inside the bottle. One reason I don't like it is because when you introduce air into the material over a prolonged uh, periods of time, it degrades the material. The second reason is when, obviously, if there's air leakage in there, the material evaporates unexpectedly. I've had a case where I had a couple bottles where the pipette was already pre-built into the cap. It was a full bottle. I never really used the bottle before. And then like maybe seven, eight months down the road, I went to grab the bottle and I saw that it was no longer full. It was about seven, you know, three quarters of the way full, way, uh, way full. And I realized, holy crap, my material's just been sitting there slowly evaporating away because of this stupid cap that had the pipette dropper built into it. So never again will I purchase those. Now, uh, I always stick to uh, caps that have the plastic polycone liner inside. And I don't know if you guys will be able to see that on camera. I'll probably just post like a little picture up here showing you what that looks like. And the polycone liner on the inside is shaped like a cone. So when you're actually twisting and turning the cap on, the cone, the poly plastic cone on the inside pushes down firmly on the outer rim of the top bottle creating a perfect airtight seal. The more you twist it, the tighter the seal gets. Now don't over twist it because then you run the risk of actually breaking the plastic polycone liner. Just twist it enough until you feel the tension and then you're, you're good. So caps polycone liners are an absolute must. Now the last thing uh, we're gonna talk about that's an absolute necessity, uh, talking gibberish, absolute necessity is alcohol. You're going to need alcohol because, well, in fine fragrance, everything that you see in a department store, all the sprayers are in those fancy bottles are all diluted down in ethyl alcohol. So you can purchase small, you know, 32 fluid ounces like this, or Once you start getting the hang of things, you can start purchasing alcohol by the gallon. I've got five gallons sitting over there. I've got gallons sitting up there. I've got plenty of alcohol and you're going to need a lot of it. Because if you think um, when you're making a fragrance, let's say if you finish a fragrance, if you make a 100 ml bottle, just a single bottle, well, if you do an EDT concentration roughly, so that's like 10% concentrate, 90% alcohol, that 100 ml bottle is already gonna be full, pretty much primarily mostly alcohol. So you're gonna run through a lot of alcohol real quick, uh, especially once you get to the swing of things, you get the hang of things and you start you know, turning and burning you know, fragrances, you're gonna go through a lot of alcohol. 
So, but the type of alcohol is what's really important, not the quantity. Uh, the only alcohol I will ever use is a specific type of ethyl alcohol, and it's called SDA-40B. And that type of denatured alcohol is pretty much the gold standard in perfumery. It's what all the big houses use. Uses. You go to a department store and you're purchasing, you know, Dior Sauvage, what, you know, Prada, whatever. Everything that you see in department stores are always diluted in SDA-40B ethyl alcohol. Now, there's two kinds. You can get SDA-40B 200 proof, which is pure alcohol. You can get SDA-40B 190 proof, which is mostly alcohol, but with a little bit of water into it. There is no right, wrong, right or wrong way. You can get either the 190 proof or the 200 proof. What really matters is sticking to SDA-40B ethyl alcohol. Um, me personally, I like getting 200 proof because it gives me control of how much water I can put into the fragrance. If I decide to put water into it, you don't need to. There's a huge debate on whether fragrances should or should not have water into it. I won't get into that debate, but I like getting 200 proof alcohol because if I do decide I want to add water to my finished fragrance, I can. But if I had SDA 40B 190 proof that already has water added, I'm pretty much stuck at that ratio of alcohol to water level. So I just get the SDA 40B 200 proof. And I think that covers pretty much all the basic essentials. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about what materials you should buy as a first, first purchase because there's just thousands and thousands of materials to purchase and I can just be rambling for hours talking about my recommendations. I'll probably do another video uh, explaining some of the, the first go-to buys that I think everyone should you know purchase as far as raw materials, but not in this video. For now, I'm just gonna focus just on the essential equipment that you're going to need if you want to actually do perfumery at home the, the, the right way. So I think that pretty much covers everything, uh, unless I'm forgetting, oh, I am forgetting something. Another thing you're going to want to purchase Test sprayers. Um, when you're doing, you know, formulations, you usually don't know how your fragrance is going to turn out. Like you lay out your materials, you make a trial batch, and you you want to test it. Obviously, you want to test it on skin. So you're gonna, you know, make a trial batch, dilute it in alcohol, fill up like this little five or ten ml sprayer, and you know, test it on your skin. You smell it after a day or two, and you're like, eh, I don't like it. I'm gonna make another trial batch and maybe tweak the formula. And you're gonna keep tweaking and tweaking formulas, which means you're gonna burn through a lot of these little sprayers. So Amazon, again, another great cheap place if you go, if you want materials that you, you constantly, frequently use a lot, uh, you can get something like a box of 100 sprayers, these you know 5 ml 100 sprayers for like 10 bucks. So go ahead and just get yourself a couple boxes. You'll be using a lot more of these than you think. Uh, yeah, okay, so I think that covers everything as far as essential equipment that you'll probably want to get when you're first starting up your DIY home perfumery journey. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna wrap this video up and I'll probably do a follow-up video explaining some of the probably good first purchase buys of raw materials that I think everyone should purchase as a first timer. Uh, but that, that'll be another video. So with that being said, until next time.